reactivating of the Acacia Park in 75 and particularly 79. I reactivated in 75 and started a, tried to start both parks, and uh, Acacia Park and Bancroft. Uh, when you have live music and you have older people, they need a place to sit because you're running a two-hour program. Or anybody else would come along and they would sit for a few minutes and then participate. We could not get in, get the seating capacity for them in Acacia Park. We had it in Bancroft. Bancroft uh, ended up being more like the old original Acacia Park. So live music had its place. Can music had its place when teaching but it could also be used, and as has happened, everybody started making records to make money. Greed. I'm very blunt on this. Greed, selfishness. I think every caller that ended up in seminars, became semi or professional or traveling callers, all made records. Well, now you have destroyed the intrinsic and the aesthetic value of the original purpose of the folk dance. Because it is that fiddler up there playing the tune. Even though it might squawk once in a while, that people loved. They loved to hear it, and they clapped their hands, and they pat their foot. And I learned that, and I know now, I should have followed, I play banjo, tenor banjo, and I should have been and stayed with music and forgot the calling. There's where I learned. Maybe that is because of not knowing, if you want a little history. My father was accidentally killed on the railroad in Lahana, Colorado. He worked for the railroad, and that was two months before I was born. I did not know till later. He was from West Virginia country. My mother was from Missouri. I did not know until later, for some reason, they did not share with me because that was quite a traumatic thing for my mother. And that's one reason she moved to Colorado Springs was to save my life. Old Doc Timmons, the baby doctor at the time. But when I look back, I didn't realize that I was told later as I grew up about what transpired. My dad played banjo. I didn't know it. My mother played uh, harmonica or juice art. I didn't know it. Was that where my interest in music came from? I don't know, but I still, I thoroughly enjoy good music, particularly now bluegrass is kind of the dance, the folk dance or the music of the people. The, uh, you go to can music, you now have the opportunity of playing many, many things, but they're not authentic. They're not the same. So to put the choreography together with faster music or different phrase music causes the dancers to have to run to get through the figure. It's not balanced. And uh, in the olden days, uh, they, to fit a piece of music, they changed the music to fit the choreography. They didn't change the choreography to fit the music. So that if it meant you needed a two measure backup in the music to accommodate a promenade, which is French, leisurely, joyously walk about together, they could ch we could change the music, we could shift. You'd never know the difference. If you're on canned music, you can't do that. See, so you took away some of the ability of the caller to accomplish what is needed to build unity with people in dance. 
Now, what was the position of the caller in terms of getting things moving and keeping things going? Didn't hear you. I'm sorry. What exactly was the um, place of the caller in in this in fitting the dancers into the music? How much leeway did he actually have to? Uh, if you're on your toes and you get the building block foundation knowledge, stair-step knowledge of dance that the old timers knew and passed on. In a patter call or hoedown where you do not have the sequence repeating itself, you give the dancers two to four beats ahead. You give the call two to four beats ahead of the change so that there is no doubt, there is no drop. I gave an example. If you're patting your foot, one, two, three, four, swing your partner. Alaman left with your left hand, right to your partner, right and left grand. You're ahead of the dancers all the time, and mentally you have to do that as a caller. And this then takes the tension off of the floor. Did I answer you good on the uh, records and the live music? Yes, Not, yes. Nothing will ever replace live music. Do you prefer live Not music? Not totally. Do you prefer All, live music? Any time. Any time. But you're forced sometimes to use the canned music. Money. It's expensive for orchestras. And the other reason is there are not many left that can really play the old time music. They've all passed on. The group that I originated and the orchestra I started back in the 50s, they've all passed on. Uh, I replaced in the park programming, I think I replaced orchestra sometimes almost uh, each season because you could not get continuity with it. But we always managed to have at least uh, five or six pieces of music. But nobody seems to want to be in the simple life, the less complicated, the easy going. Uh, but they are, they, that will change too as we go along. The, um, Teaching, I think, if you're teaching in class, uh, can music is still a preference. Only because of you don't want a fiddler sitting there uh, waiting for a half hour to play a tune. Uh, both for cost and both because they lose their enthusiasm. They've got to play. They've got to be a part of the rhythm. There's a great story about rhythm in the spiritual valley uh, that you could get into with this, Nancy. It, it tells you why you do these things in life and why they were given to you. Not many people want to hear that. I want to hear it. Not many people want to hear it. I would like to hear it. Do you want to tell us? It's going to take you about three days. <laughs> well, we don't want to hear it. <laughs> Can you give us the short version? <laughs> Well, all of you, you want to go with a little experiment? If we had some background, but you can even do it with the clap of the hands. All of us clap our hands. Go ahead. Pat your foot. Okay. Now, do you do that when music plays? Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you do it? Here's the key to the release of the cares of the day. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm trying to prove a point. Why do you clap your hands? Do you know? Feels like the right thing to do. <laughs> you feel good about it, don't you? When you hear the music, you want to move with it, don't you? Watch what comes through this. Somebody gave you something. 
It's called rhythm. It is one of the senses that's the least written or talked about. Rhythm, the essence of all life, and that is true in everything we do. Like with myself, more difficult at this time, but if I lose the rhythm of my heart, what happens? Take it to the point with dance. It is the silent seeking of that rhythm that keeps you dancing all of your lives. Now, who gave you rhythm? You're getting heavy. You can call it what you want. I'll just express it. You were born with it. Now, this gives you the key of why you clap, why you dance. You were given the tool of rhythm to release yourself from the cares of the day by dancing. Rhythm. You were given that tool. And every one of us are different, like we are in everything else. When we are put together, your rhythm basically is going to be a little different than Tim even different than Steve. Mm -hmm. Now this is the key. How do you coordinate those rhythms of people, get them together to enjoy this in a unity, in a folk dance, and when this happens, it releases all of your bad energy. You release the cares of the day. In the calling, by it being extemporaneous, if you're listening to the call, you can't worry. Try it. Out on the dance floor, and you're listening to the caller, and he's throwing the different uh, directions, commands at you. Try thinking about the problem with the work the next day. The whole key was that we were given a spiritual value in dance to release ourselves from the cares of this world. And we're losing it. That's why I hesitated to answer your question about the future. There does not seem to be a concern or need in society for that but yet, when you look at this world, what does it need? Somebody needs to defuse the situation. Because it's, uh, I, I have my own opinion. We are high-teching ourselves into demise. There's no time anymore to sit out on the front porch you pick a banjo or sing a song with your neighbor or talk. There's no time even to say hello. Half of the time you don't even know when they're coming and going. Is that the way we're supposed to live? I'm lecturing, Steve. It's good stuff. I some, agree with you. Some, some people tell me that I... My calling, I should have been a Baptist minister. <laughs> a singing, dancing Baptist minister. It is, it's a truth. And this is one reason I have come so dedicated to it, of the preservation of this, and so many people don't know. And I'm sure that they, when they really would look at it in a simple life form, would appreciate what they were given in a spiritual value and use it for what it was meant to be. Now, what happened to your barn? You want to go back to the barn? You remember the barn? <laughs> the same thing followed through in daily life. When there need to be, and it still happens, particularly with the Amish people, when there's need for the barn, 
for whatever reason, new one, old one burnt down, struck by lightning, or whatever, the community would come together and they would share and they would build a barn. This is where the barn dance got its name. It was a lifesaver for the people in the early stages where they had meals together, they shared, they broke bread together, and they built a barn. Later come, and part of the people coming in wanting to standardize, uh, organize, we're going to straighten this thing all out. How can you straighten out a wheel that isn't broken? The People started in the 50s, and particularly 59, the reason for the break in the park programs. Segments wanted to do this over-organization. They wanted to standardize. That was all caused by greed and selfishness, and my own opinion is traveling callers. There's more depth to that. So they endeavored to change. And the slogan that was used, we must take the dance out of the barn and put it in the ballroom. Here you're raising the choreographic challenge, the competition. Here you eliminate the ordinary person on the street. They must go to the dancing master and get lesson. This also forces money, greed, costumes. Now, when you ask me the question about what goes or what happens, when you take a folk dance of a society as we had and had in America, the only thing that when I started was only one. There was not two. There was only one. We all shared together. When you take the dance out of the barn and put it in the ballroom, what you're really doing is you're taking the dance, the folk dance that represents the masses, and giving it to the asses to show their and you can fill in the blank word for that to ever correct itself. You have to take that folk dance that was meant, and I just give you the explanation of rhythm and why it was given to you. Each and every one has a different rhythm. Not everybody can fit in that ballroom, socially, politically, or whatever, until they take that folk dance out, away from the asses, and give it back to the masses. I don't know what will happen to it. I represent and have in my career the masses. Not ashamed of one bit. Wonderful people. Have a wonderful time together. So did I answer your question of what the future is? Maybe. <laughs> I didn't give you a positive. I can't. I don't think there's anybody that can. Now, do um, you want to talk about that split in 1959 between the um, the barn, the barn, and the ballroom type of dancing? Um, how did that affect people here in Colorado Springs? Same way. It's all over. It doesn't make any difference. See, you're taking a representation of society. all over. And when you take it and change it, I'll, I'll come in from another angle for you, okay? And it, it's in much of our industrialized world, in the automotive world. And I, I refer to it myself, when you take the intrinsic and aesthetic value out of something, and you make it commonplace. 
you make it standard or you make it bland, what do you have? You see, you're taking the uniqueness of your character, your rhythm, and you are saying, okay, Nancy, you got to forget that. You've got to be a robot. You have lost the communication to the silent seeking of perfect rhythm because you're going to seek it in your own life, in your own way. And it has to be learned and accepted. And without criticism or challenge. I'll give you an example, okay? Remember how you used to drive down the road and you could see a Model A or a Ford car and a Chevy car? And many times, if you were a child or you're sitting in the car, you would count the different kinds of cars that you would pass on the highway. Drive down the highway today and tell me what kind of cars you're passing. Yes, they're all fancy, they're all new, but can you tell the difference? The intrinsic, the simple values of our folk dance, our cars, our life styles are being depleted. Where is our American representation? I'm very strong on that, but there's nothing I can do about it really other than I'll speak my opinion, which I just did. That's what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. That's what we're asking for. <laughs> That is one of the reasons that I stayed with it as long as I did. I was giving something. I didn't buy it at the drugstore. I didn't write it. I didn't invent any of it. And neither did any of the other leaders. They may think so, but that was given to me by fellow man and woman. And it was a message to me to pass it on to people. That's my own. You asked me about my calling. I think that's a lot of it where it comes. I was given the talent to be able to communicate to thousands and thousands of people, Nancy. through the different medias, through the different programs. I, uh, I, I, and not in braggadocia, uh, I would feel I have taught over two million people. But it was given to me. I didn't put it together. I am just passing on what the wonderful people, T.F. Pop and Mae Rooney, Catherine and Bill Wright, Bob Cook, these are older people that were strong leaders at the time. And that is how all of this was passed on from one to another, and it got lost. I'm sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, would you have known this? if I had not shared it with you? No. Would Steve have known it? No. If I had not shared it? No. You see, here is what's missing. I think if people really could see, and it's what it was put there for, their attitudes and that might change. No, I Thank you for listening. Yes. <laughs> to my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? Now, I do have to ask because you were mentioning all the... Say again now. I do have to ask because you were mentioning all of the um, people who were an influence on you, and I know that Lloyd Shaw was one of the more well-known proponents of square dance here in Colorado Springs. Do you want to talk about him? Not particularly. <laughs> no. Uh, 
Pappy learned from basically the same sources and the people that I did, even though I came later. Uh, and a very industrious person, uh, very capable of promoting, and uh, it was an opportunity for him to take something and bring it forward for himself in the field. But we must remember, he didn't write it. Many people misunderstand that. Uh, Pappy himself was not really a caller, per se. He's what we referred to in the field as a chanter. He couldn't carry a tune on a singing call in a bucket. I worked with Pappy, uh, Pappy, I had him on the park programs for years. And this doesn't take away from the man's ability to do what he did. But who else was able to do what he did? In other words, if you look in his book, he tells you specifically that he gathered all of this from the stores of the local dancers and callers and put it together and carried it from there. Now, he's not the only one in the world. Henry Ford and Mrs. Ford was ahead of Pappy Shaw. They were in the New England area and they preserved the contra, the formalized side of dancing that came from the British Longways. And uh, he had the strong interest in preserving the contra, the ballroom, the cotillion, the formalized side of the dance, more what you would call the ballroom. He even went into his one, I think it was in Vermont. <coughs> he was so strong in his belief. He went in and a, a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Lovett was an instructor caller in this particular inn. And uh, Henry Ford approached him, says, I want you to come, and he was building up this, he has a big hall there in Dearborn, Michigan, for this very purpose of the preservation of the formalized thing. And uh, Mr. Levitt told him no that he was committed to the inn uh, on his contract and whatever. Henry Ford bought the inn, took Benjamin Lovett back to Dearborn, Michigan and ran 